Hi, this is Blake McCarthy. I'm the writer of Territory, which is currently on Kickstarter. Go to Kickstarter and search Territory Issues 1 through 3. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at BMC Comics, B-M-C-C-O-M-I-C-S. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who is our first guest today? So who do we have as our first guest today? Our first guest is... A talented writer uh, who has a Kickstarter campaign currently ongoing from an amazing comic that I happened to read two of the three issues on, and it is called Territory. But we are joined today by the ever-talented Blake McCarthy. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me on, Kurt. Nice to have you on. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Blake McCarthy. Um, I'm a pretty new comic writer. Territory is my first series, so I really started writing about three years ago. Someone kind of grew up reading comics, uh, was out of it for a while, and then got back into it and had a couple stories I wanted to tell and self-taught myself how to write them, and here we are. It's always wonderful to see a comic like this because it's something new. It's a, it's a fresh take on the kaiju element, which is popular these days as well too but it's popular for those that love that type of genre as well uh let's talk about your team specifically because obviously unless you were writing and drawing and doing everything yourself then you know you would have said that but who is the team you surrounded yourself with with this particular uh comic series definitely so the artist is named chris sassman he's based out of south africa he is similar to me he's a, a fairly new uh creator at this i think he's been doing it for a little longer than i have but he hasn't been doing it for as long as you think he would looking at his art. He's incredibly talented and uh, still growing a lot because he is so new, which is exciting to see. And then our colorist is Ichsan Ansori, who is uh, based out of Indonesia. So Chris and Ichsan had worked together um, before. So when I reached out to Chris, he recommended Ichsan. And I'm very glad he did because Ichsan has been incredible on the colors. Uh, just super detailed, really brings the world to life. Letterer is Marco Della Verde. He's kind of the veteran of our group. He's uh, based out of Italy, but he's he got the most industry experience of all of us for sure. He's worked for pretty much all the big publishers, um, both indie and, you know, sort of more mainstream. So he not only is an amazing letter, really good design sense, really good at moving the story forward, but he's also been amazing behind the scenes as well, helping us put this project together with a bunch of newer creators, um, you know, helping us avoid some of the pitfalls that other newer creators might have. Our editor is Nicole DeAndrea, who was unfortunately not with us for issue one. I wish I had uh, talk to her then, but now she's on board and she will be for the rest of the series. Very good storyteller. She's got some projects of her own. And then also um, a really good understanding of story of pacing has really elevated, I think, every issue she's edited and make it a lot more entertaining and interesting to read, make it flow a lot better. Then looking at the uh, Kickstarter campaign, obviously, um, as of this recording, which is still going to be posted tonight once we're done as well, too. So you have how many days left? And it looks like from what I last saw, it's almost funded. Correct. So just checking it right now. So we're at uh, six days left, so just under a week. And we're 97% funded. We're only $85 away from our goal. So really exciting. This campaign has been the most successful so far. It's had a lot of momentum behind it. Uh, people have really seemed to be enthusiastic about it, which has been great to see. As a new creator, the first issue, I had no idea what was going to happen. No fan base or really connections to speak of. And so our last two issues, it's, it's good to see that there have been some people who have really enjoyed the book and have uh, come back for this third campaign and help spread the word. And people like yourself who have allowed me to come on or who have helped promote the book have been a huge help in just the indie community in general. So this, this campaign is going really well. We've got, again, some great alternate covers. Uh, returning artist Martha Walmersley has another kind of cool neon alternate cover. And then got a new retro cover from a couple of other creators, as well as all sorts of catch-up bundles and a variety of other extras, including being able to get drawn into the book or get an original art page of one of the covers. So kind of something for everybody. So then 
Why was this an important story to tell? And, and now they have three issues. How many more issues do you have? Uh, so this is going to be a five issue series. It was originally going to be six, but then once I did get Nicole on board to edit, I learned overriding and stuff. There was a lot that could be parsed out. So I think five issues will be able to tell the whole story, especially from the third issue on out, it really ramps up. So it's it's getting to the exciting part now and we're full steam ahead. I've had this story kind of floating around in my head in, in various incarnations for multiple years now. The main inspiration was I wanted to tell a kaiju story. I'm a big Godzilla fan. Love just kind of all kaiju media. And I knew that that's kind of the story I wanted to tell, but then it was figuring out how to do something different with that and how to kind of ground it to make the human side of the kaiju story interesting. And one thing I've always been intrigued by is um, faith and belief, because that's been something that has, you know, spread across cultures and regions and time and is still prevalent all over the world, especially the idea of people growing up with a certain faith, sort of getting indoctrinated into a certain faith, and then how that faith and their beliefs and how they see the world is challenged and how they change that once they kind of experience more of real life, experience more of the outside world. And that was, so I just really wanted to get that kind of human conflict of having your beliefs being changed by um, having them challenged. So have you had your beliefs challenged when you were writing this series? Yeah. So one thing that's been really fun to write is it kind of, I want to include characters sort of from all viewpoints. And so I have my beliefs, but I kind of need to look at, you know, both my beliefs and the opposing viewpoint, so to speak, to try to represent represent basically the full spectrum. You know, there's uh, really zealous believers, there's cynics, there's people, you know, all over the middle. And how do all those people interact? Just like in, you know, society, we've got such a wide range of people, especially in today's society with the, you know, the prevalence of social media and stuff who like to argue over their beliefs and, and what others should believe and everything like that. And so it's been really interesting getting to kind of think about how, you know, the opposing sort of viewpoint would think, how they would think, how they would act and, and try to get that into the character, as well as, you know, trying to express sort of my beliefs through some of the characters, but not make it super preachy or like I'm, you know, trying to scold people or cut anyone out. So what's the most misunderstood aspect about the kaiju genre that maybe people that don't follow it misunderstand? I think a lot of people think it's, you know, just sort of cheesy B-movie entertainment. And obviously there's a lot of that sort of kaiju media out there. That's kind of where it got its roots. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm a big fan of a lot of uh, sort of B-movie style kaiju entertainment. I think one thing that a lot of people don't think about is the original Godzilla, sort of the original kaiju in a lot of ways, was representative of something greater. He was representative of the atomic threat to Japan at the time and the fear that um, kind of gripped the country. And I think that these monsters and these, you know, these characters can be used as a metaphor for so many different things. You know, in this, they're, they're used as a metaphor for faith, they're used as a metaphor for belief and, you know, how much we can control and how much we can't control. And so I think, you know, just a lot of people see them as just those two guys in a rubber suit fighting, while in reality, a lot of the stories behind that are those monsters are representative of, of something else. And, and, you know, it's a metaphor for a greater topic. I always find nameology interesting, and especially when you have something along the post-apocalyptic post world, it, it's obviously the conventional names kind of go out the window. <laughs> When it comes to this type of stuff, how'd you come up with some of the names of your of your main character? Definitely. So I wanted to make this post-apocalyptic world feel very isolated and very different from our own. Uh, it's supposed to take place in a pretty far distant future. You know, they they don't remember. They're not uh, familiar with you know things like airplanes, cars. You know, those are sort of myths to them. So I, I felt like giving the characters different kinds of names uh, would help create sort of that distinction, you know, make it feel like it was far future, not as connected to our own. I didn't really have any sort of strategy or method. I just kind of played around with names until I came up with ones that work. You know, I wanted them to sound simple enough that they would actually be used as names, but also names that I hadn't heard actually used in today's world. Looking at yourself as a creative writer, when you put this script together and the art was being made and these pages were coming back. What was a scene that you wrote that when you got the art back for it was way better in the artistic form than it was on the page? 
There's been kind of a lot of those. I mean, that's one thing I really like about working with Chris is I feel like he's a very good visual storyteller. You know, he's not just a technically sound artist, but he also understands how to tell a story with pictures and especially sort of the uh, human interactions between Alkia and her parents, um, especially when she kind of first encounters the Great Horn, which is this the main kaiju, this big monster you see behind me, you know, it's an exciting experience because this is the God of their religion, but at the same time, it's a frightening experience because obviously there's a lot of potential danger there. And so capturing that moment with her and her parents coming back, you know, and her parents being both thrilled and scared. And then also the other character, Nebo, who is kind of the cynic, but is Aokiya's friend and the way he kind of factors in and her parents are sort of dismissive of him, you know, due to his beliefs, but she's still feeling close to him. So there's a lot of different sort of relationships going on in that scene. And I feel like Chris really captured it well in just a couple of panels. Do you think you could survive your post-apocalyptic world that you created? I'll actually say yes. Fortunately, kind of just through life experience, I've, uh, you know, I'm a, so I'm actually a firefighter paramedic. I do some conservation work as well. So just through that, I've kind of gained enough skills that I feel like I could probably rough it out for a little bit. Now, that being said, uh, that is not a guarantee <laughs> at all. <laughs> What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Through school, through high school, it was something that the more I I really started to read and write and write creatively and try to tell my own stories, you know, rather than just fit a prompt or something like that, I learned that it was a way to express your ideas in a way that you could convey it to others. And, you know, because a lot of times it's hard to just tell someone what's in your head, but if you can write it out, if you can, you know, build a story or even just sort of build an argument or, you know, build an article that really explains what you're thinking. Um, It gives a lot more people access to the ideas you have. And so therefore it gives your ideas more power because it allows you to, you know, spread them, let other people interpret them, think about them, give their opinion on them. What's your creative kryptonite? Uh, I don't know if it's cheating to say, but it's definitely got to be promotion, Um, (laughs) you know, especially social media and stuff. Um, As far as like actually creating Pacing is very hard. I tend to overwrite things a lot, especially in the first couple drafts. You know, I want to put every detail that I've got in my head on the page. And then it's hard to sometimes parse down, okay, what's actually relevant to the story? You know, I can write a whole th- a whole world, but if it doesn't actually go anywhere, the story doesn't move along very well, you know, then it's, it's not a very good story. So just taking out that overwriting and, and keeping the pacing consistent. I want to have you back on for a longer show, actually, because I'd, I'd love to do an overrated, underrated kaiju edition. I think that would uh, be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. I'm always on to talk about kaiju. So, Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Um, probably the biggest inspiration for me is actually my brother. He's in a, a heavy metal band. His band is called Wayfair. So it's kind of heavy metal mixed with some kind of Western old style country. And it's just, it's really unique and creative. And the whole aesthetic he's got around it is great. And he's someone that really since high school, he's kind of done his own thing. He's he's a very creative, I think he's a very creatively intelligent person. He's, he's done a lot of amazing projects, uh, you know, with his band. And then he's really expanded that, like he does a lot of graphic design for him and does a lot of work. He sort of built this whole feeling around them. But one of the things that really inspired me was he always did it his way. His The sort of music he plays is different from any other kind of music, even within the metal scene. It's very unique and it's something that his identity expressed through creativity and just seeing that he, you know, didn't compromise that the whole time, was able to really create what he wanted to create without trying to alter it to make it, you know, more successful or more popular or more what other people would want um, was just really inspiring. And so it's inspiring me to hopefully tell the stories that, you know, I want to tell and not necessarily the ones that I think would be the most popular. From a professional standpoint, you've created three comics, you're going to create up to five. And and I can't wait to see what else you do professionally as well in the future. So professionally in that regard, you are successful, especially with this campaign almost being completely funded very, very soon, I hope. So go support them, by the way, on the Kickstarter link below. (laughs) Other than that, do you consider yourself 
personally successful? Yes, I feel very fortunate, especially as a newer creator. I, you know, I wasn't really sure how Kickstarter would go. I wasn't sure if I could get an audience. I wasn't sure if people would dig the story. And so now on the third issue, and like I said, especially to see people coming back and, and spreading the word and the positive, uh, you know, things that people have said and momentum behind it uh, has, has made me feel very pers- or very successful, both personally and as a creator. And then I'm very lucky in my personal life because one of my biggest inspirations for doing this at all was I have two boys, seven and three, just about eight and four. And that was kind of um, the catalyst to start writing was I, you know, when they started getting a little bit older, they kind of got me back into comic books again. And, you know, they were always asking about stories and characters and stuff like this. And it just kind of made me realize that I could tell my stories and use this medium to tell them. And, you know, seeing them and, and their reaction to, to seeing territory and to seeing the things I make and, and the, you know, how happy it makes them is, is really cool. It makes me feel uh, very personally successful as well. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? The answer I want to say is I try to, I really do try to learn as much as I can from all my failures. I am constantly telling myself that I'm still a new, you know, a newer creator. A lot of the stuff I'm doing is still either, you know, like the first or second time I've done it. And so I I don't know, you know, for sure what I'm doing yet. I'm still learning a lot. I'm not an expert on anything. And so when I do fail, just really try to look critically and say, okay, you know, what can I learn from this? How can I improve? Look at what other people who have done is successful and and do that. Uh, One thing that I did a lot before I started even the first campaign was, you know, I backed a lot of campaigns, but really tried to look at what made the campaigns I was interested in, what drew my interest, you know, obviously the story was one thing, but then each campaign usually had something either in the way it was presented or reward or the, you know, creator themselves and the way they um, marketed themselves or talked to people. And so really just try to look to people who have done whatever I'm trying to do and whatever I've failed at successfully and, and try to, you know, learn from them and, and apply it to what I'm doing. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you and that you're inspiring them with your amazing comics as well too, hopefully they become creative in some way, shape or form, whatever that may be. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Um, What I hope is that they will be able to, one, just look that they can do it. I mean, one thing that I am kind of proud of and I think is a good message for everyone is before I had the first campaign for territory, before that book was done, I had done literally nothing really creative at all before. I hadn't completely written anything. I hadn't tried to publish anything. I didn't have any artwork. I didn't have any social media presence, anything like that. I really wanted to tell this story. So I found a group of talented people because that's one thing is you definitely need a team around you. But just not being afraid to put yourself out there, not being afraid of failure. You know, I don't know if there's an audience out there for this. You know, I don't have anything built in. There's no guarantee this is going to work but I'm going to do it anyways, because I think this is good enough. You know, I enjoy it. I'm proud of what we've made. And I think if we can show enough people that we've got something good here, we'll get people to buy in. So just being able to take that leap of faith, so to speak, and and put yourself out there and put your stuff out there to be judged, because that's hard. You know, you feel like whenever you put something out, that means other people are going to look at it. You'll never be able to really grow creatively unless you're willing to put yourself out there. So hopefully the, this will inspire other people to do the same. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Man, this is a tough one. <laughs> if I had to make a comic book about myself, I would want to title it The Man Who's Looking to Make a Difference. And it would be, I guess, about, you know, I would want to do something like you'd have, you know, sort of a group of heroes or whoever it is, you know, your Justice League Avenger sort that's out there doing amazing things. And then you, you'd have... Uh, somebody who's, you know, trying to find the, the gaps where he, he can't do the, the things that some of the other ones are doing, but, you know, just trying to find kind of his niche, his role to to do that. And then as far as a soundtrack, I mean, if I had to go with like a favorite group, it would be Outcast, but I don't know if it would really fit the theme. <laughs> the soundtrack, I would have to go with maybe, I don't know, maybe just some sort of like positive vibes, sort of, you know, hip hop, indie rock, something like that. I've never thought about, you know, like a comic book from me before. So it's like, dang, well, what would I do? You know, maybe, try to make it more fun somehow. Exactly. Maybe you have to start writing that then, you know, when you're, when you're in your downswing of uh, after this series is done. There you go. 
Well, I do hate to say this, Blake, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Before I let you go, because this is where we get you to actually promote yourself, because, you know, you said you were having trouble doing that. Where can we find you and how can we support you on the internet and uh, any social media or websites? And of course, where is the Kickstarter? Uh, definitely. So the, the big one is Kickstarter for issues one through three is live now. If you just go to Kickstarter and type in territory, it should pop up. The full title is territory issues number one through three, a post-apocalyptic kaiju epic. And then if you want to follow me, uh, it's mostly just going to be territory stuff, but I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Both of them are at BMC Comics, so B-M-C-C-O-M-I-C-S. A lot of territory stuff there, but also a lot of the other um, amazing kind of people I've met and some behind the scenes stuff as well. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking. And of course, Support us on our Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash TGT Media. Every little bit helps. Thanks again, and see you next week on Two Geeks Talking.